this notice has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. Texas Government Code Section 551.001 concerning purposes permitted by the Act, including 551.071 consultation with attorney, 551.072 deliberation regarding real property, 551.074 deliberate the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignments, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public employee or to hear a complaint and charge. So, so this evening. Um, so this evening we are absolutely thrilled to be able to honor our national merits to my finalists and joining me here on, on the floor for recognition purposes are um, Board President Jane Cunningham and, and Trustees Arturo Sanchez and Jeff Larson. We are the proud home of 18 National Merit Semifinalists. These outstanding students are among approximately 16,000 students in the nation to have earned this impressive title on the basis of incredibly high preliminary SAT scores. Um, these academically talented High school seniors now have the opportunity to continue in the 2022 competition for 7,500 national merit scholarships worth nearly $30 million. So we will recognize these honors, honorees individually, but let's start with a round of applause for all of them.
So, um, as I call your name, please come forward in order to um, receive a medallion and be recognized. And I'll, I'll ask that you hold your applause until we conclude the honorees for um, each school. So, from Clearbrook High School, we are pleased to recognize Victoria Wynn, Evelyn Tran, and Joanne Tran. Congratulations. Please come forward. Yes, please stand. Sharon Lopez is also principal is also here to, to celebrate. Make sure that there were not other honorees um, from Brook here this evening. Okay, um, so I would um, also like to, we also like to recognize from Clear Falls High School, Acadia Ferguson. Congratulations, Acadia. Congratulating your students, Alexander King, Alexander Lee, Lee Luana Leo, Mark Lou, Jack McBurnett, Etienne Rainey, Alan Shen, Tatiana Vasily, Rebecca Wang, Tiana Wang, and Richard Yu. Congratulations. High School, Rachel Goss, Siddharth Kabuluri, and Grace Zo. Congratulations. Incredibly um, proud of each of these honorees. We know you will achieve great things, and we appreciate um, family members and friends and uh, principals coming to join the celebration tonight. Thank you very much.
once again, we wanted to thank our uh, National Merit uh, semifinalists. It's usually 2 million students, um, and only 50,000 students are recognized. So quite, quite an honor, um, and kudos to those students. I'll let us pause. start community input. The purpose of community input is for the entire board to receive feedback from citizens. The board will hear the public comments but will not respond. Matters brought forth that require a response will be addressed by the superintendent as appropriate. All information received is subject to verification. Community input is scheduled for 30 minutes and has two forms. Those requesting to address the board in advance of the meeting are granted three minutes to address their topics. And those who sign up this evening prior to 6.30 are granted one minute. Public comments regarding items on the board agenda shall be heard prior to public comments regarding any topics not on the board agenda. Non-agenda items shall be heard on a first-come, first-served basis. A total of three speakers shall be allowed for each non-agenda item topic. Public comments of non-agenda items extending beyond the 30-minute time frame will be heard after all other business of the board is conducted. A staff member will monitor the time. The board has requested that no personal names, insults, abusive, or profane, profane language be used. Failure to follow this request may cause the public comment to be terminated. And I ask that we hold applause and things of that nature um, just in the interest of uh, time and so everybody's comment can be heard. And I, after having our, our state This past weekend, I must say that, you know, our board meetings, we have a certain decorum in our community that is unlike um, other places where we've heard they've had to stop board meetings and things of that nature. And I like to say it's because we are respectful of everybody's comment, including those that do not necessarily share our views. So with that in mind, um, our first speaker is Ms. Armstead. and Andrea Miller. Did that work? No. So we will move to Mr. Mikhail Williams. Has made profound impacts across the country. I have 
stuck up. We have several staff members who have went through this in other districts and on our campus who told me it was life changing. I've not found anyone to sponsor us yet, and I attached the brochures to Christ. I would be thrilled if we could get either partially funded and I would triple invest in that time out of my discretionary budget. I know it is a tall order and it would be a lot to ask for, but I 100% believe it would make a big difference on our campus. Please let me know if there's anything else you need from me. Thank you. And I've provided the link for the Greatest Challenge for Middle and High School Program. For 20 years, Greatest Challenge has been the leader in bringing permanent positive cultural change to schools. Our live assemblies, trainings, and support materials offer a proactive preventative intervention for school violence and self-harm. Understanding the unique challenges educators face in this moment, we now offer enhanced digital and virtual programs that accomplish the same great outcomes we have produced with over 17,000 students nationally. These new programs work to stand alone but also in tandem with our powerful live presentations and strong lasting impact. I would request the board confirm the greatest challenge at Seagull Campus and the Eureka Combined Program at $48 million. I would also suggest that the board consider funding all eight high school campuses with the same program. I think in these challenging times and uh, uh, increased uh, tribalism, that a program like this would help our students combat, uh, combat a lot of the stresses they face in the period of the Great Challenge. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Next, we have Andrea Miller. And then uh, Dana Cantera. My name is Andrea Miller, and my seven-year-old is in second grade to be enrolled in this program. This is the third month I've spoken at board meeting, and I do feel so frustrated, ignored, and undermined by the district. I'm at a loss. You've been given information and strategies to keep our children safe from some of the most qualified and highly regarded medical and scientific minds in the region, such as those doctors who will present tonight, those who have written you letters in recent weeks, and even those of you who met with Dr. Kaiser, like Dr. Williams did last week. They've encouraged you to do things like support schools to provide outdoor lunch spaces, maintain cohorts on the playground, perform contact tracing when there's a positive case, require a negative COVID test result for symptomatic pupils to return to school, masks temporarily, provide testing services on site at schools, incentivize vaccinations for staff and eligible students. But instead of doing the best you can to mitigate for COVID in our schools, we learned Thursday that protocols would be relaxed and our most vulnerable students would be further risked by allowing unmasked and unvaccinated teenagers and adults increased access to the schools. I'm tempted to rant about the lack of respect this shows for parents and students who have worked so hard to stay safe in this school. Why did I buy an air filter and special masks for my child if you continue to undermine our efforts? Instead, today, I reviewed the responsibilities of the board on your website. Board members are supposed to serve as advocates for the children and families they represent. My seven-year-old understands that wearing a mask helps to keep her three-year-old sister safe, yet disregard the impact her actions have on our families. Two, focus on the best interests of Clear Creek ISD students. Over 2,000 students have contracted COVID per the dashboard, which is not even close to the actual number of sick kids. At least 10% of those will have long-term health problems due to COVID. Is that in their best interests? Three, maintain objectivity. More than one board member has publicly stated that certain mitigation efforts will never be considered. How is that objective? Four, we'll base decisions on the available facts and independent judgment, not special interest groups. The medical and science community has presented data and facts that support doing everything possible to prevent COVID. A small but loud contingent of people who attended the last meeting yelled the most and seemed to have persuaded this board that their special interests in denying the severity of this pandemic matter more than the health of our children. Five, make decisions in the best interest of the student's education, even when the decision may be unpopular for political or other reasons. Somehow protecting our kids during this pandemic has been politicized. We all want our children to remain safe in school, yet 
his thwarted administration has given to end the political pressure and his sacrifice on behalf of our children to do so. So I'm once again asking you to step up and be defenders of student health and safety rather than yanking the bush to both extremes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Miller. And next we have uh, Dana Cantero. Next, we have uh, Chris Haas. Chris Haas, followed by uh, Ms. Parisi. Good evening, members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak once again. Uh, I'm Chris Haas. I'm a physician in the community and I also have a master's in public health. At the last board meeting, I spoke on the CCISD COVID protocol. I appreciate the additional clarifications that were made to the protocol, but I do feel that there are several sections of the protocol that are ambiguous and can still be improved upon. I'd like to request that the board communicates how the public can best provide further input on it in the future. The second point I want to touch upon today is analysis of COVID. I would like to request that the board members not perform their own analysis of the data, at least not without consultation and backing of conclusions from public health experts. A recent analysis shared with the community did not account for causality, causal relationships, was based on a single point in time, and did not consider the power necessary to make a conclusion. This information was misleading. 
It is also important to keep in mind that studies we will have ultimately will be population-based. These studies will never be as strong as the gold standard controlled trials, which have multiple barriers to being able to complete in a student population. For this reason, it will be difficult to say at the end which mitigations work the best. This will be frustrating for many, but comes with the territory of population-based analyses. Our measure of success, however, will be the same as it has always been, namely seeing our kids continue to grow and learn. What we do next and how we do it is important not only for the health of our kids, but also the health of our community. If we can reduce the spread amongst kids, we can reduce the number of hospitalized and deaths from COVID for the entire community. It is important that we don't let our guard down as we will have some time before vaccines are available for all school-aged children. In closing, thank you again to all those on the board, the parents, teachers, and community members that continue to work hard to make our schools as safe as possible. I spoke before this board more than two years ago to request a change to the policy known as FC Local School Attendance Zones, which you are voting on tonight. As I stated in July 2019, a member of the 2019 School Boundary Advisory Committee moved out of state less than five months after this body approved its recommended school boundary changes. These changes significantly and adversely affected many neighborhoods. This board must require SBAC members to make a good faith commitment that they do not intend to vote for changes and then leave. Otherwise, they have no skin in the game. Further, on the last SBAC committee, not one member's neighborhood boundaries were changed. I request the board table tonight's vote and amend CCISD policy to ensure affected neighborhoods have adequate representation on future SBACs. I will email you my proposed link for the policy once again, although those of you who have been on the board since 2019 should already have it. Second, let's talk about the Houston Methodist vaccine buses on CCISD campuses. I can read you a list of statistics, but if your internet still works, you should easily be able to find that a disturbing percentage of vaccinated adolescents experience serious side effects, including myocarditis. The district sought out Houston Methodist to bring these buses onto campus. Surprisingly, or not surprisingly, there is no written contract, no procedures if something goes wrong, and no accountability from the district. Let me tell you about someone adversely affected by the vaccine. Maddie DeGaray was 12 when she volunteered to be part of the Pfizer COVID vaccine trials. She was a healthy, energetic, kind, sociable girl, and a straight-A student. But within 24 hours of getting the second shot, she developed unbearable abdominal, muscle, and nerve pain. Over the next two and a half months, she was admitted to the hospital three times, each stay longer than the last. She developed additional symptoms, including gastro gastroparesis, memory loss, headaches, fainting, seizures, and many others. Maddie is now paralyzed from the waist down and needs a feeding tube for nourishment. Maddie could be any one of our children. There are many stories like hers, each more heart-wrenching than the last. News outlets are afraid to report them, but so many devastated families have shared their pain on social media. They, too, thought the so-called vaccine was the right decision, until it wasn't. We cannot and should not expect our children to protect us. And our schools should not incentivize our children to get an experimental gene therapy treatment with peer pressure and get out of class passes. Get these buses off our campuses. Do not bring them to our elementary schools. I promise we will remember who sits silently and who takes action. By the way, when I requested a summary of the equity audit as presented to the board, instead of releasing the information, the district hired outside counsel to request an attorney general's opinion so it could control the flow of information. An outside law firm where the district's own in-house attorney used to be a partner. me back. My name is James Pettering. I'm an internal medicine physician and a flight surgeon at NASA Johnson Space Center. My wife, Rita, is an infectious disease specialist who's been on the front lines of this pandemic since day one. I'm also parents of a CCISD student. I'd like to use my time to suggest some simple strategies you can take to keep your kids safe and in school for your consideration. Thank you for your efforts 
practice the social distancing for lunch, but we can do it even better. Please make outdoor lunch time and space a priority in the way that allows. This can be as simple as allowing students to bring a yoga mat or towel to school to have a picnic style lunch, outdoors on the grass in recess areas or blacktop. We can also allow classrooms to rotate outside and provide a picnic table or move tables temporarily out of the rooms to provide those that remain inside some more distant seating opportunities. We can also allow parent volunteers to provide more staff and manpower for lunch monitoring scenarios. There are many parents ready and willing to do this. I'd also like to thank you for allowing individual classrooms and lunches for air purifiers. But right now, parents are doing this by means of grassroots efforts behind the scenes. Please allow and encourage social the school administration to set up official sites and online groups to obtain donations to fund those air purifiers so that all areas of the school have equal opportunity for a safe environment. There's plenty of press of HISD and PISD organizing air purifiers and picnic tables to be used later. But within CCISD, parents are on their own. Please encourage our PTA administrators to work with us publicly. Public health officials, epidemiologists, and doctors have studied the majority of their lives to keep people healthy, and the overwhelming majority of them are speaking with one voice here. Please show and send a message to our students that education doesn't even matter if you need our advice. Thank you very much.
Jennifer Cox. Thank you guys for letting me speak. I would like to thank you all for allowing freedom of choice this year with masks opening up all activities and now allowing parents to participate in their children's schools. I know the teachers love the help from the parents and I know kids live for these moments so they are very happy right now. Since my emails have not been answered by your board, please go ahead and raise your hand if it's a yes so we can see how much you care about our children's health and well-being. Please tell me, do you know how many kids died from the flu in 2016 through 2019 in CCISD schools? Do you know how many more suicides we had this year, this last year, compared to other years? Are you aware that we had more car accidents this last year with students? Do you think lack of oxygen could have affected their driving? Have you asked a single kid how they are doing this year, how much more better it is this year without masks than last year? I would like to address something that the Galveston County Health Commissioner said on the live stream with Dr. Williams. He mentioned schools have closed in previous years for flu outbreaks, and I'm curious what schools he's referring to. I know the year my daughter performed in Shrek, more than half of those kids had the flu during multiple shows, and there were at least five throwing up on the side of the stage during the performance. Are you aware we lost three high school students in 2017-2018 school year due to flu? Tell me. Do you wear your mask in groups where you know everyone or just with strangers? Do you wear your mask while alone in the car? I see a small number of kids walking by themselves wearing a mask. How are we not teaching them that fresh air is always better than recirculated exhaust air? Why are we acting as if every child is contaminated and contagious? We know asymptomatic spread is proven not to be a factor in the spread. And last time I checked, treating healthy people as though they are sick is a mental illness. It's called Munchausen. Do we need a counselor to treat the mental illness that seems to be spreading across the minds of those who view everyone as sick when they aren't? Every one of you that's wearing masks right now, you're telling me you are sick and contagious. Are you? Healthy people don't spread disease. If somebody is sick, they stay home. They don't feel well to go out. Tell me, Dr. Williams, is bribing your teachers with an extra jeans day if they wear their masks for their health or to influence the kids? If you care about these kids' health, you would teach them how to read food labels, provide vitamins every morning, provide healthy meals at school. You'd stop trying to be our kids' doctors and just focus on having great teachers and a great education. Our kids are enjoying this school year because they have the right to choose what's best for them along with their parents. I'm grateful for that. CCISD is a great school district. Let's keep it that way. Fear should not be the driver in our decisions. When fear is present, logic is not. Facts have been completely ignored this year, and last time I checked, 99.997% chance of living is an A plus in most cases. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Um, Jennifer Cox.
Steve Dawson and Aaron Dempsey. decisions on whether we need to quarantine our child, whether we need to keep them home, whether they get exposed, whether we need to have them tested. My daughter had a case in her class. That child had a sick sibling at home, had a sick parent at home. They both had COVID. The parents sent their child to school this morning. They have been in a room every day. Dr. Kaiser in a Facebook Live with our superintendent claimed that the COVID vaccine is the safest vaccine that can be administered. And parents should not hesitate to vaccinate their children. Anyone making such a claim and any policy based on this advice should be questioned. The Pfizer study used to justify COVID vaccines for children had a poor sample size of just 2,000 volunteers out of 49.5 million kids in America and no long-term studies. Certainly not definitive evidence to support Dr. Kaiser's bold claim of safety. A claim that now has Houston Methodist vaccine bans coming to our schools. This vaccine does have the most their support of any vaccine in history. Newer studies showing that teens, especially boys, are seven or four to seven times more likely to be hospitalized for a vaccine-related cardiac event than for COVID. Unless this vaccine is 100% safe for our kids, it should not be aided and abetted by CTN ISD, who is liable for all vaccine-related injuries. At the time, we are not supporting the Houston partnership. Uh, once again, I, I appreciate uh, all of the community input. is uh, appreciated, and the board takes all of that into account when making decisions. Dr. Williams for Mr. Bailey. Thank you. I'd like to immediately move on to the Friday Promise uh, uh, session topics. I want to begin my remarks uh, tonight highlighting the work of Bank of the CCISD Highlights 
that I'll mention. Um, we'll see with um, COVID-19 active uh, case trends uh, in CCISD continuing uh, a downward and a downward movement. Um, today, Fairbank ISD's active case number uh, in early afternoon was about 123. This is significantly lower than the 670 cases a couple of weeks ago. The case number, however, is still relatively high in comparison to our case number for most of last year. And so with this in mind, we, as you know, we, we remain a stage three health mitigation protocol. We have expanded opportunities for parents and students. And as you know, uh, parents and parent and staff communication went out last week highlighting several um, factors, and we'll get into that. But we are still um, recommending face coverings. We're continuing with uh, staff members at the healthy intermediate level of supporting consistent, proper wearing of face coverings for those parents who, who want that for their children, maintaining social distancing to the extent possible in classrooms. We also did a breakfast and lunch at elementary and the designated areas for eating areas for high school and elementary school. Due to the space, we need to miss some students who may not have visitors during these times in the cafeterias at, the time, at this time. However, um, parents are welcome to visit our schools at other times, especially for parent-teacher conferences, assemblies where the children are being recognized, whether they're volunteering or meeting with PTA and groups of club persons, um, groups of club members, which can happen in person. Um, and as uh, trustees know, we continue to monitor the case trends within the Fairbank ISD and the broader community and make adjustments as appropriate. Related note, um, in terms of remote conferencing and virtual learning, um, we launched remote conferencing at all kindergartens in Fairbank. I thought I'd not been um, reported on that, but um, we, um, we, were most, um, we launched remote conferencing at all grade levels, and it's specifically, it's specifically for students who are home due to a temporary medical condition. It's temporary synchronous instruction. shout out to the, the instruction team, teachers, librarians, and substitutes for helping us bring learning into the virtual living rooms uh, of our students. And as you might imagine, enrollment fluctuates greatly based on the number of students home due to the temporary medical conditions. Uh, so one day we were sitting there at 93 um, students anticipating. Also, our virtual learning program launched after Labor Day. And this online learning program is for students in grades K through 6 who opted to learn online versus coming to brick and mortar. And currently we have 545 students in the virtual learning program. In terms of enrollment, our enrollment numbers continue to increase this year. We currently have almost um, 3,900 students enrolled, which is up approximately 100 from last year. And also want to share that we are pleased to note that Fairbank ISD was named among the top 13 employers in Texas by Forbes and Forbes partnered with, yes, that's exactly, Forbes partnered with a market research company, Statista, to compile the third annual list by surveying 80,000 Americans working for businesses. And I would call us a great, great company, um, nationally ranked number one in each of these regions. I will say that uh, we are actively hiring at Fairbank ISD. Um, September 28th, we're hosting a job fair for uh, auxiliary workers. And so we have current postings, job postings on, that are listed on, online on our page. And you'll be able to check those out when you get that. And uh, that presents my brief, uh, that concludes my brief uh, district updates. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Next, we will move to action on closed session items. Do I have a motion for item number one? Uh, Mr. President, I would like to make a motion. Yes, Mr. Cooper. Uh, I would like to make a recommendation for Director of Business and Support Services, uh, Kathy Smith. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Do I have a second? I'd like to second that. And Mr. Larson, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. So that is it. Seeing that I have a motion and a second, do I have any, um, any comment? Seeing no comment, I'll call for a vote. All in favor, please.
break through to you. Because we don't want to carry this stuff to the world. Next, we'll move on to consent. I think that everybody want to pull up a good quote here somewhere. See no further comment. Uh, can I get a motion? President, I move to accept the consent agenda as presented by Ms. Sayer Lee. Thank you, Dr. Dupont. Do I have a second? Mr. Sanchez? Thank you for the second. So thank you for those remarks. Um, do I have a second? Mr. Control, thank you. And I will just comment and reiterate, you know, thank you for the uh, due diligence to um, our, the staff, our, our counselors, for also uh, massaging those schedules. And also, um, as mentioned before, in the Dr. Williams update, And item B, consider adopting the 2021 tax rate. Mr. President, Mr. Barker, I think the uh, corporate tax rate was increased by the adoption of the tax rate in 
the second finest payment on altering the property. Mr. 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 President, um, if it's if the board would like, um, we can do the staff presentation, um, which will also provide context regarding the initial um, recommendation the staff has written for, um, and then you can proceed to the to the review of the regulatory text of the new rule. Ms. Benzai. Of those single family residents have those exemptions on. 
actually gave it back home to the Bayou State Museum on that time and gave me a $46 tax increase for the tax return. However, if you were to look at the tax percentage increase in the years prior to that, and then when you read between those, it would be a 2.9% increase in the year that that money would have been returned. We did an analysis this year just to show you districts in Houston and wanted to see where the three value state fell as compared to those. And so you'll see this uh, chart is actually ranked highest, highest to lowest on the tax, total tax rate, um, with Galena Park being the highest and it being reflected here. You can see Clear Creek is near the bottom uh, with our tax rate, although the homes, optional homestead exemptions vary by 10 to 5, anywhere from actually 0 to 20 percent. Clear Creek is at 5 percent, provides a 5 percent optional homestead exemption, but we did, did want to show that we have one of the lowest MNF rates uh, of these districts, and we also have, uh, there's only four other districts that have a lower INS rate than the three value state. We also did a comparison of in Galveston County and look how our tax rate compares to those, the other uh, area districts, and we would see we're in the middle. Basically, we're able to decrease the, our, um, because of all those things I mentioned, we're able to decrease the IMS rate by four cents, which is really bringing the taxes down to offset the, the impact of the increase in property values. Is that correct? <laughs> which I was using the 823, and it's actually a 9% increase. It's varying because our values keep refreshing and rolls keep coming back okay. and adjusting for tax. Okay. Um, so somewhere in there, I used an 8.3%. And actually, so the, the, if you just consider the m and rate tax rate, the taxes that in, the, would be paid on an average value of home actually went up based just on the m and rate. And so then, on the INS rate, that's kind of bringing down the overall tax impact on the county. Okay. Um, so, and the other thing I wanted to point out is the graph that you talked about. Thank you. 
the exception for our entry and team. So, so I think we've been very conservative in terms of trying to uh, not be able to dump the tax rate around. And so this is pretty significant in April in, in bringing it down four cents, the IMS rate, um, without uh, uh, really decreasing the tax, tax impact on the, um, the calculation. I think the calculation that I did, and I realize that these are going to be different, um, the difference in those two tax rates that I have on the rate that's being proposed is seven tenths of a cent, I think. So it, it's a very small amount. And I think when I calculated that into using the, an average home value, which for a business that was $232,000, of changing our tax rate is going to be $28 a year for an average home, a home that has that average home value. So it's going to be an increase of $28 a year. And when I calculated it with the no new revenue tax rate, the um, difference is $17, I think. And it's a, it's a very small difference between those numbers. And so I'm, I'm wanting to balance the value of I'm very much understanding not wanting to bounce our tax rates around be able to look at what's happening in the future um, versus still giving a pretty big uh, tax cut in terms of the, um, the IMS rate that's going on. So I, is everything I'm thinking correct? <laughs> yes, and, and one of the things that we did, we tried to do was a five-year debt service forecast. And with the rate that we're proposing tonight, the debt service budget that you approved in August, deficit budget of $1.7 million, so we felt like we could tap into the debt balance in the debt service fund and gradually bring it down to the current monthly tax rate. By this tax rate reduction, uh, we forecasted a 5% value for the year for those three years. That's a hard thing to predict down that far, but we felt like that was conservative. Uh, if we were to bring it down um, to the Year and still be uh, over the course of four years, uh, 
most secure Hebrew home. We had brought the taxes down. That was the recommendation. I am asking us to bring it down even more, okay? So that our pending fund balance drops from $32 million down to a pound $28 million. And that's, again, that's considerably ahead. So this is where we live. It could be in one of two places. It could be either be in our taxpayers' pockets or it could be sitting in our fund balance, helping them essentially save for a rainy day. I think we've got enough saved up for a rainy day. I, I, I really appreciate the work that's very well taken, that we would like to keep our tax rate flat so it's predictable. We know how much that we're going to pay every year here. We do appreciate that. You know, people do appreciate it. But I just think they appreciate a little bit of savings in the middle, and that's uh, why we do this. So. I, I think that by reducing it from 29 cents 
second to last in scope of this book. Um, if there is no question in my mind whatsoever that Paul's in favor of the thing you have to do, I just want to clarify that this is not for the weak of the body. It's not the recommendation that we're to uh, do for the weak. Um, the first step is very important. It's what Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. He came to be a prisoner for the good. Okay, so, so with that being said,
Let's go move to item C. Mr. Dustin Hardy, I thought he was going to be a little bit with us only two weeks, a little bit less than that. Uh, so, but he is going to get the bulk of the credit for uh, today. So we thank Sir Mr. Dustin and uh, for responding to um, information about the vision um, for our event for the next five, six weeks. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Uh, Board of Trustees, I want to start with just kind of giving you some background of uh, why we're here. This is uh, not typical. Um, usually, we purchase uh, laptops for students more in the springtime. Um, so there's been some things happening uh, that we had this discussion with earlier. Um, to begin with, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there is a uh, worldwide shipment set to leave right now. Um, you go out to buy automobiles, appliances, HVAC equipment, and unsurprisingly, laptops. Um, they're not going to be available in a timely manner. Right now, there's currently a seven Regardless of anything else happening, what would probably be here right now asking for this purchase now to uh, meet our timeline for attendance at uh, our campuses. Um, our current plan uh, was already in place for uh, to purchase 4,000 laptops at the end of the school year to replace uh, five-year-old laptops next school year, and next at the end of next school year to purchase 10,000 laptops for the uh, following school year. Those were already set in stone. We've already found uh, money mechanisms for those. However, due to the American uh, Rescue Plan, um, the FCC uh, created a new emergency connectivity fund known as the ECF um, to purchase for technology, for in technology, laptops, hotspots, those sorts of things. Um, this is utilizing the current uh, E rate process, if that sounds process uh, the school districts have utilized for well over a decade, uh, typically for network switches, access point, or infrastructure items. Uh, however, the, this plan has been put in place, not all the necessarily the same E-Rate rules, but definitely the same E-Rate process, filing windows, uh, and things of that such. Um, the filing window was actually open and shut. We did submit $7.17 billion available for school districts to utilize. Um, the FCC said up front that there were no guarantees necessarily. After everyone applied, there had been a second filing window because there was so much funds available. Um, there's about $2 billion uh, for school districts to apply for still. We believe it's due to the fact that most school districts utilize the CARES Act fund uh, last year CCISD, we had a great obsolescence plan. We're able to utilize that, and uh, we believe we can see a lot of this funding. So that's kind of the background of why we're here. Uh, we're going to kind of go over a uh, more graphical <laughs> uh, representation of what this looks like. sixth graders. Um, they're currently in tenth grade. We are already looking to use $1.6 million of ESSER funds uh, to replace those as those students come back in the 11th grade and 12th grade. Um, so that was already uh, the plan. And then next school year, in that school year, the plan was to utilize the $1.8 million of ESSER funds, supplemental zone and CCISD funds, to replace the devices purchased in 2018-19 for the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. So that was the plan. Now, because of 
six million dollars in cut from the ECF funds and uh, eight hundred and eleven thousand three hundred dollars from the ESSER funds. Uh, those are of course the additional services that uh, the ECF um, uh, qualified for in the same budget. So, uh, so what does Jeremy do? Give us a quick update on on possibilities for obsolescence rate for the city of Black Rock. The spring uh, of 2023, we would have replaced those grade levels. Um, and as Mr. Hart did, we increased grade levels in spring of 2023. That has now shifted to this year, which is why you see a four in spring of 22, which is the first year that we did the ECF on the or ECF the ESSER funds. Um, that would mean that we have no devices that we must purchase in spring of 23. The next set of devices that we need to purchase or look to replace would be five grade levels. district chooses to, over the next couple of years, to, to decide to spread out the cost of these devices, that we know that that cost over time. Um, one possibility could be that we purchase two grade levels of uh, the spring of 23 and three grade levels of the spring of 22. So that's just kind of looking ahead. Um, so four grade levels in the spring of 2025. a grade level's worth of devices in the spring, and then as you recall, the Dell devices that we had were failing after four years, and thanks to the Bells, we were able to replace those devices mid-semester, and that really helped our students at the high school level to get those four grade levels worth of the, we were four grade levels plus the one grade level um, of the high school teacher, the five grade levels. Um, so if we're able to split those up in future years, Save the district um, 4.8 million from next school year, uh, or a total of really probably all of um, 6.4 million ought to be able to use um, from the these fund resources. Um, we did a cost comparison and got quotes from different vendors as we were going through the required package and ended up incorporating three funds with the lowest cost. number so that they would be reimbursed to the FCC directly rather than the big guys who had to pay for that less money. Um, so there would be a net nerf, uh, nerf sum to the, the big guys who had to pay for that. Is that going to be a nerf sum in the next year that you would be using that money to anticipate? So it's not going to be a long term investment. <laughs> it should be 21, 22. Um, for, for this 21, 22 school year, this is to be implemented um, in May where the school district is required by the FCC. Um, and then we'll have the full fund in 21, 22. I'd like to open this up for any questions. Backup devices 
questions that you have because I'm assuming that some of these devices that were in the joint sale were using the backup devices, correct? That is correct. Um, with the purchase of the um, digital grade level, those devices have only been in place for four years, so we do have a limit of one year left. That only goes to those that bring a wireless set of additional spare devices in, uh, in all campuses, all 12 of those campuses. Right now, we have a handful of spare in each campus. Um, about one of the care teams taking one of the devices from there, which is actually positive. Uh, but we have a number of welcome devices that are lost. about seven, seven months away. Um, I was originally thinking of stretching this to October, November. However, we wanted to get ahead of, get ahead of other districts that were thinking about replacing their devices. Thank you. Dr. Dupont. I, I appreciate the forward thinking and the trying to plan ahead and all this too. And I know that you said that there's still $2 million available in, in that fund. And I know that So there is the potential, too, that in the, if you look at the bottom of that one chart, that there is a potential to use escrow funds for that, too, if, if needed. That is correct. Now, I'll just say, I know last year, at, at the beginning of the school year, we hopped on, you know, making sure our, our K through 3, you know, had devices, and we were able to get those before a lot of the other districts, I think, caught on and realized, oh, we need one or more, you know, devices as well. So um, I appreciate you guys seeing an opportunity to um, use some government funding in order to help us, you know, um, look at our replenishment and then, you know, have a plan for what we're going to do with those devices and figuring out, you know, the replenishment aspect. Also, can comment based on uh, what I saw at the, at the conference I was at on the weekend, and that's uh, uh, I got to talk with people from a lot of other school districts, and uh, it's I'm really impressed at this plan of action and how much better a shape it is than CCISD and, and so many of the other peer districts. Really appreciate the good work. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Thank you. 